Once again, let's take another look at Naoko Ogigami, the director behind Rent-A-Cat and Kamome Diner, this time with one of her projects released in between these other films. With this one, you can expect many of the same elements which seem to permeate much of Ogigami's filmography. Trademarks reappear once more, like quirky characters with questionable origins, the need for family support groups, and the meaning of life. Y you know, the big stuff. What's more, today's film, Toilet, shares another element with our recently covered Kamome Diner, that being a foreign setting. Viewers who saw our coverage of Ogigami's background in the Rent-A-Cat episode will recall that Naoko Ogigami attended university in America, meaning she likely drew on some of her experiences as a foreigner in a strange land for Kamome Diner. While that film dealt with being an expatriate from the perspectives of three Japanese women living in Finland, Toilet flips the script and takes a look at a Canadian family of adult siblings whose grandmother is a Japanese expatriate who has come to live with them in the Canadian big city. This time, Okigami took things a step further than in Komomi Diner. Where that film did have a minimal amount of Finnish spoken, it was mostly filled with Japanese dialogue. The Finnish in that case was relegated mostly to short moments between Sachie and her cafe's patrons. In Toilet, meanwhile, we're dealing with a family of three characters who speak English exclusively, a characteristic which actually becomes something of an important aspect for the film's narrative and themes. So just what is this film? An English-language, Canadian production written and directed by a Japanese woman who spent some time attending school in America. What is it about, and what does it want to tell us? Toilet is, in simplest terms, another character study from Naoko Ogigami, featuring primarily a cast of four characters, Rei, Lisa, Mori, and Bachin, the latter of whom is played by Masako Motai, who viewers will remember as Masako from Komome Diner. At the beginning of the film, we kick things off with the mother of the three kids and the daughter of Bachin dying. Yeah. Anyway, this death in the family ends up bringing the quartet together, in spite of their being distant for years at this point. Ray, arguably the primary son, is a disaffected lab tech who has no real interest in nor time for his siblings. He seems to have some tenuous connection with his Japanese heritage. Given that we observe him watching mecha anime with no subtitles, while he constructs mecha model kits, Ray's younger sister, Lisa, is a university student who takes care of her older brother, Mori, and in simplest terms, won't take Ray's crap. She's openly antagonistic towards Ray when her elder brother refuses to forge any sort of bonds with the family, in spite of their mother's passing. Mori, meanwhile, is something of an enigma for the bulk of the film. We're told from the get-go that he's an agoraphobic artist who has stayed in their parents' house for years now. Besides that, he's not given much definition as a character until later on, which we don't want to spoil up front. Mori has a relatively close relationship with Lisa, is completely separate from Rei, who seems more annoyed by Mori than anything, and seeks actively to bond with their grandmother. Bachin, who again doesn't speak a word of English, is left in her daughter's house to work with the children. Bachin is honestly one of the more compelling characters in spite of barely uttering a single word on screen, showing Motai's acting prowess even more so than perhaps Kamome Diner did. These various elements, which seem to have been driven apart as they've grown older and into their own, arrive when we leave their mother's funeral. We're left to wonder how Rei will get drawn back into the fold so that we can learn more about the other family members. Well, that comes about when Rei's apartment building burns down, leaving him without a home while the insurance payout sits in limbo. This forces him to move back in with his siblings and Bachin in their family's house. From that point, we watch the family drama play out, dealing primarily with how Bachin's and the kids' cultures clash and meld, as well as what their respective lives mean and might amount to as time goes on. For starters, the children don't understand Bachin. As we said, there's a language barrier making the whole group separate into two groups, the kids and Bachin. This divide is bridged slowly, but surely over the course of the film, meaning that Toilet shares this in common with Kamome Diner. Both films are concerned, in other words, with dissecting how different cultures can come together and bond over shared ground. For starters, we have Ray deciding to save only his mech models from his burning apartment. While we initially imagined that this, combined with him watching unsubtitled anime, meant he retained an amount of Japanese cultural heritage or language proficiency. 
We were, however, proven wrong in the long run. However, what Ray watching these shows could mean is that he may have grown up on them, just as a number of Westerners have used anime as an entry point for Japanese culture in recent decades. This would mean that Ray may be interested in bonding with Bachin from an early point. The situation grows slightly tense when we see a replay of Sachie's fears from Komome Diner, this time realized at a party no less. To celebrate Ray moving back into the house with his brother and sister, the siblings buy a giant sushi platter for dinner. Bachin seems put off by this, while the kids can't fathom her rejection. As one says, Maybe Bachin doesn't like sushi. It's impossible. She's much more Japanese than any of us. Only after further urging does she even try a single piece, after which she seems visibly unimpressed and excuses herself from dinner. The difference illustrated here is how the children have never been to Japan and are buying sushi in a foreign country, unsure entirely what to look for in terms of authenticity. Bachin, on the other hand, only recently moved to Canada and grew up in Japan, implying that she should know her sushi. The reason we say this is a callback to Sachie's fears in Kamome Diner is due to a line from the film where Sachie is discussing her hopes for the restaurant. She states that she doesn't want to only attract homesick Japanese people, nor Finns looking for sushi. She wants to make what she might see as more authentic comfort food from her home country. Ogigami is, in both cases, utilizing sushi as a cultural export often lacking in authenticity. Since the 1980s, sushi has become for many Westerners, a symbol of Japan, and has become so popular outside of Japan that it's difficult to discern what's authentic and what isn't. In other words, Ogigami seems to be arguing that something like sushi leaves the door open to a false perception of Japaneseness. This confusion is vindicated later when Bachin purchases the ingredients for and sets about making gyoza. Sitting at the kitchen table with her grandchildren, they partake in a legitimate form of cultural exchange, rather than the Canadians trying to impress their Japanese family member with what they see as her own food. Here, the grandmother is bringing home to them her own recipe, a true import, in other words. While the cultural divide and bridge are presented twice throughout this exchange of foods, the title of the film actually lends itself directly to this message as well. In fact, the thesis statement of the film comes from an observation that Ray makes offhandedly to one of his co-workers when discussing Bachin's stay with the kids. Every country's culture is reflected in the way they use the toilet. This comes after multiple mornings spent concerned as to why Bachin seems so disgruntled or exasperated at using their toilet. He concludes, after prompting from his lab partner, that it must be due to the Japanese toilets being more technologically advanced. This is not an ordinary toilet, Ray. This is advanced Japanese technology. This view playfully toys once more with Ray's idealized version of Japan. Regardless, the point is made quite clearly that these two basic functions food and waste, are universal to the point that they both inspire diversity, and they can bring us together. This is perhaps the central intention of Toilet, to show that, in spite of language barriers between Bachin and her grandkids, they can at least bond over these commonalities. What's more, the different ways in which they explore these elements of human life can help inform each side about the other's worldview as well as their character. The other major aspect of Toilet concerns life at large, both as an individual and within a family unit. Ray, in his opening narration, states that, I think life is all about enduring a constant stream of boredom. For him, this might as well be fact. Ray spends the better part of his time lost in his own world, whether at the lab where he actively ignores his coworker, or at home building model kits and watching anime reruns. He's learned to ignore his siblings' demands and wants, as well as the phone while he's at work. Ray's blinders are up so high that he thinks this is all there is to life, and he in turn assumes that this is all anyone experiences in life. Bachin, on the other hand, is the one person who is able to break Ray's malaise. She's different enough from what he has made his norm that he wants to understand her desperately, an attribute which takes on several aspects over the film. Initially, Ray remains obsessed with whether she's even their real grandmother, or a grifter trying to scam free room and board off the family. This offers a major subplot which helps develop the relationship between the siblings. Mori and Lisa are repulsed that Ray could even suggest this, while he finds their lack of questioning to be disturbing. In the long run, however, Bachin breaks Ray's armor by making him food, 
the aforementioned Gyoza. This serves as the first time in perhaps years that someone has offered Rei a reason to move outside of his comfort zone. He's genuinely curious about something for the first time in a while, meaning that he is, by definition, no longer bored. In fact, the two become so close so quickly based on this very human interaction, that Rei ends up smoking with Bachin in spite of him saying, Only uncivilized people smoke. Up to this point, we see, through a favorite technique of Ogigami's, repetition, Rei being called out by the siblings for his suspicion of Bachin. Mori and Lisa both call Rei cold at least once before he makes up with Bachin and learns to accept her as a part of the family. It takes her oddity, from his perspective, to break this programming, however, given that Rei seems to view the world much more coldly than them. Rei is almost scientifically minded by comparison with his more artistic siblings, who are arguably better at rolling with the punches. All the while, Mari and Lisa never abandon Rei. They may call him out for his misdeeds, but they stand by him. At one point, a college poet, who's a classmate of Lisa's, mocks Rei from afar and comments that he seems to be all alone and thus pathetic. Lisa, without hesitation, claps back, because he might have a sister and he wouldn't die alone, showing how strong the family's bonds are in spite of Rei's poor representation of this. Lisa is, compared with Ray's cold nature, relatively malleable, being a younger, liberal-minded college student. She is seen to be out and about learning what she believes in, while he has walled himself off both at work and in his own room. Lisa equally finds a way in which to relate to Bachin, where it was food and toilets for Ray, with Lisa, it's air guitar. She explains to Bachin, as best she can, that there's a world championship for air guitar coming up in Finland. This she explains by example with an activity which is inherently all about body movement, thus transcending the language barrier between the two. When first expressing interest, Lisa is concerned she won't be able to ask Bachin for the money to enter a qualifying tournament. But Mari encourages her, saying, She's not going to understand me. She will. No, she doesn't speak English. Yeah, but she understands. You just have to put your heart into it. This pushes Lisa to express herself truly, finding another bridge between the two. Mori, meanwhile, is distant from the world outside, even more so than Rei. His only true attachments are to Lisa, Rei, and Bachin, his art notwithstanding. As we learn from the progression of the narrative, Mori wasn't always like this. His agoraphobia is a recent development which came when an incident forced his worldview to falter. Through the support of the family over the course of the film, Mori learns to accept himself and love being in his own skin, which in turn allows Mori to pursue his musical career once more. Thanks to the family's help, Mori even says that It's pointless to ask people the reasons for their urges. Meaning that we shouldn't question from where harmless urges arise, but accept them thanks to our family's support of us. This is made even more direct when, in an almost throwaway line, Ray shows his acceptance by asking Maury plainly, Are you gay? Then dropping the issue as soon as Maury says, No. The key point to Toilet is that the faulty parts of each individual are covered up by the collective of the family. This is something that Ray doesn't understand initially, believing himself to be more powerful as an individual apart from his family. However, as we've seen, he's merely secluded and bored in this way. By accepting them, and allowing them to accept him, he reintegrates with the group. Each individual is like this, with others making up for their shortcomings. Lisa and Mori both need money, which Bachin covers for both of them. Mori is a shut-in. While his mother's memory and legacy help this, perhaps more importantly it's the support of Lisa and Ray when he is stuck outside that help bolster him. Ray, meanwhile, is distant from people, which the family mediates by softening his coldness and his hardness. Also similar to Rent-A-Cat alongside Komome Diner, we're not interested here in how these folks make their money and survive. Once more, the minutia of how Bachin got to be so loaded, and how the three kids got into their positions where we find them, are beside the point. In anyone else's film, Toilet may well be the typical tale of how these people survive as individuals with more respect paid to financial and employment hardships in each person's life. Ogigami, on the other hand, wants to place her characters in a vacuum, where they're not at risk of poverty or strife. 
It's in this setting, a world without social friction, that we can follow how they get along as people and as a group. Toilet is an important film for several reasons. It's brought Ogigami's work more readily to a foreign audience, given that it was filmed in English. It seemed to distill the earlier points about cultural exchange made with Kamome Diner. And it serves as an enduring piece on the importance of family, no matter who we might find to be a part of our collective.